everybody. I'm Mark Lanier and I thank you for joining us. We're filming this not from the chapel where I've been filming the series, but actually from one of our library conference rooms. It's got a different setup. You'll see that behind me, but I'm thankful that you're here. And while we have changed some, the word of the Lord is unchanging and it is constant and it is forever. So let's dig into it immediately. This is part two of a longer 20-part series so far on the road to Emmaus, looking at, at pictures and teachings and doctrines and themes about Jesus that are found in the Old Testament. Last week was part one. You can see it on YouTube or you can see it on, on our Facebook page or somewhere else. But last week we started looking at Ezekiel chapter 37, and that was the story of the lesson of the Valley of Dry Bones. Now, a lot of people, they don't read Ezekiel. That's not one of your standard books just to sit down and read. In fact, a dear friend of mine and a brother told me he's reading through the Bible in a year. He's in Isaiah. Ezekiel's right around the corner, and he's dreading it. I thought, dreading it? No! What you need to do is put Ezekiel into context, and then you don't dread it at all. You feast upon it. It's a voluptuous feast of tasty morsels that you get to enjoy. And so I decided one of the things we need to do this week is continue to look at Ezekiel chapter 37, but we need to take a step back. And I want to at least first put it into some context for you to follow. And then after I put it in that context, we'll put the passage under the microscope. We'll look at it carefully. And then the third and final thing I want to do is find the, the New Testament colors in this Old Testament story. And so if you'll join me on that today, we'll start by putting it in context. Now, one of the hardest things for us to do is to put ourselves back in the mindset of a people who lived 2,600 years ago in a whole different part of the world with a different culture, a different language, a different food. I remember when I was growing up, I lived in Rochester, New York for third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, and a good bit of seventh grade. And as a kid, I had a good friend who moved there from England. His name was Robert Howard. He and I were best buds. We would spend all of our time together. Most of the time I'd be trying to teach him how to play baseball and he'd be trying to teach me how to play what he called football but was soccer for me. And when we were playing baseball, you could be Roberto Clemente, you could be Lou Brock. If we were pitching, Bob Gibson or someone who's really good. But when we'd play soccer, He'd want to be Bobby Charlton from Manchester United. I didn't know what Manchester United was, and I'd certainly never heard of Bobby Charlton, but I understood that that was a major thing to be, and so we would fight over who got to be Bobby Charlton, even though I had no clue who he was. And so there I was, this little kid, who was looking to be Bobby Charlton. And I, I, I really wasn't very good at being Bobby Charlton, but... Anyway, I tried. So that was life in Rochester, New York. So from Rochester, New York, in the middle of seventh grade, we moved to the hub of the plains, Lubbock, Texas. And I lost track of Robert Howard. I don't know where he is. Hey, Robert, if you're watching this on the internet, email me. I'd love to catch up with you over the last 54 years. Not quite that long, but a long time ago. 50 years anyway. We didn't keep up. It was a complete divorce from my prior life to live in Rochester and then move to Lubbock. So that doesn't happen so much today. Today we got social media. I mean, people can keep up on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, things I've never even heard of that they're doing. We've got ways to find each other on the internet. Everybody's got a smartphone or a cell phone. I was dealing with some people in Guatemala a, a decade ago. And there are these mountain tribes where nobody knew how to read. And all of a sudden they had learned how to read. Why? Because they had cell phones given to them. 
They didn't learn how to read in school. They had to learn how to read to text each other. Just the pragmatics of it. This has totally changed the way we are. But you go back, go back before TV. Go back before radio. Go back, heavens, before electricity. Go back before mass transit, which predated electricity. And what happened when you moved from one place to another was cataclysmic. I mean, you move from one place to another, you're looking at a different language. You're looking at a different culture. You're looking at a different future. I mean, tomorrow is not what tomorrow would be. You live in my house. I know what tomorrow is. I know when trash day is. I know, I know when you harvest which crops. I know when the chickens lay the eggs. I got all of that. But you translocate. You move. And by the way, you move and you get a different job. And back 2,600 years ago, you move and you get different gods. See, Ezekiel's written at a time where Israel, Judah actually, had a forced move. Judah had been conquered by the king of Babylon and had been carted off into captivity. Now the Babylonian Empire, if we put up here on the screen a satellite view of the Middle East, the Babylonian Empire was a huge empire at this point in time. We're in five to six hundred years before Jesus. And the Babylonian Empire was huge. Judah, the Jews, not so huge. It would be this little bitty dot right there. Judah, all of Judah, half the size of the county Harris County, where Houston is, in terms of land mass. Less than that in terms of people. So you've got this little speck in the mountains of Judah against the entire Babylonian Empire. And that's very important to the context of Ezekiel because of the mentality that the people had. The people considered gods to be tribal and local. So the various people groups had their various gods. And their various gods had territories that were theirs. Which is a big deal because if Israel gets conquered by the Babylonians, in the mindset of the people, the Babylonian gods were stronger than the god or gods of Israel and Judah. And I say gods because while God told them there's only one, they frequently tried to worship others as well. They were an idolatrous lot for a good bit of their history. But within the framework of this idea that every god had their domain, their dominion, where they were powerful, the gods would fight each other as the people fought each other. And the winning army would give tribute to their god because their god clearly was the most powerful god. Now this is very interesting to me and has always intrigued me because I want to ask you, where are the followers of the god Tammuz? Tammuz, big god, man. In fact, he was the boyfriend to Ishtar, big goddess. Where are the followers of Tammuz? Where are the followers of Ishtar today? How about Molech? You met any followers of Molech? Chemosh. You met any followers of Chemosh? How about Baal? All of these were the local gods that at one time or another seemed to have conquered Israel. But those gods and those people were also conquered. And so as they were conquered, their gods dissolved into history. If their gods were not big enough to conquer Alexander the Great and the Greek gods, then what business did they have being worshipped? 
worship instead Zeus, Apollos, Athena, Mercury, for the Latin gods. I mean, why worship a god that can't win for his or her people? And so that's what happened. That's the mindset, that's the culture, that's the mentality into which Ezekiel is written. And Ezekiel is written to a conquered people who've been deported. And those people might carry with them this idea of, gee, I guess our mountain god just couldn't contend with those big bad gods of Babylonia. Now the book Ezekiel is kind of divided into two parts. The first part is a book of judgment. And the second part is a book of redemption. Josephus actually calls them two different books. But one is a book of judgment, one is a book of redemption. And the first half that deals with judgment is really interesting to read. If you've got it within the context of this, understand that Ezekiel is letting the people know that Yahweh, the God of Judah, was not conquered because he was weak. This is not a question of, of, of the Babylonian gods being stronger than the God of Israel. He was not conquered for that reason. The reason that he was, well, he never was conquered. The reason the people were conquered is because God was casting judgment on those people. See, it's interesting. If, if God were just another God, if he were just a figment of human imagination, I suspect the God of Israel would have dissolved and gone away like Tammuz, like Ishtar, like Molech, like Baal, like any countless number of the ancient gods that disappeared when they were conquered. But this was no small mountain god of Judah. That was a misperception of the people. And Isaiah writes to clarify that misperception. Isaiah wants them to understand they didn't lose that battle because their god wasn't victorious against those stout Babylonian gods. They lost because their god the true God sat in judgment on Judah. And this is set out in the, the book of Ezekiel. And it's set out in the context of a marriage between God and His people. And Ezekiel says, Judah, do you understand when you were born, you were an unwanted child. You were just left in the field. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with you. You were a squalid, just little baby waste left out to be eaten by the wild animals. But, though an unwanted child, I, the Lord God, took you. And I took you to be my bride. And this marriage, Ezekiel 16, 8 says, I gave you, this is God talking, I gave you my solemn oath, and I entered into a covenant with you as the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. But in this marriage, you betrayed me. You trusted in your beauty, and you used your fame to become a prostitute. And God says, I brought judgment upon you because that's the only way I could get your attention and do what needed to be done and bring redemption. Otherwise, you'd have continued your whoring life. And so all of these other gods that seem to have conquered Israel and Judah, God says, and Ezekiel says, no, 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 no. Understand that the reason Judah got conquered is because God was sitting in judgment on Judah. But then Ezekiel goes on to say, God's bringing judgment on Edom, 
He's bringing judgment on the Moabites. He's bringing judgment upon tribe after tribe and people group after people group. All of them will get their judgment because God is God. Israel's God can execute judgment, though, in Babylon. He can execute judgment in Edom. He's not restricted to his little territory over there in the hills on west of the Dead Sea. Israel's God is God over the entire world. And so if we see that context and understand that theme that's running throughout the first half of Ezekiel and into the second half, then we can put Ezekiel 37 under the microscope and examine it even a little bit closer. And that's what I'd like to do with you because Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones, is a story that contains both judgment and redemption. It's got both sides of that coin that you find in Ezekiel. Let's look at it together under the microscope. Or in this case, the IPVO. Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. Here's where it begins. The hand of the Lord was upon me. I love the Hebrew there because it, it means over me. Just bam, right on top of me. It's the idea of the hand of God, when, when the, the writers speak of the hand of God, that's a, a, um, an anthropomorphic term, a human body term. That doesn't mean literally God's five fingers in his palm. Hand is a reference to the work of God, what God's doing. And so when he says, the hand of the Lord was on top of me, what God was going to do is just bam, right there on top of me. Bam! And God's going to work using me. It's like um, uh, in the other room in there, I've got a chess board. I can take my hand and put it on top of the pawn, and I can move that pawn across the board. The hand of the Lord, the work of the Lord, bam, is on top of me. And He brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord. He set me down in the middle of the valley full of bones. And he led me around among the bones, and behold, there were many on the surface of the valley, and behold, hine, hine, they were very dry. In other words, these bones had been there for a while. This is a battle scene where all the judgments come, and these are the dead carcasses that have been picked over by the birds and the wild animals where everything has been picked over and the bones are just strewn about the field as the bird eats the flesh around the ribs and leaves the ribs off to the side, or the hyenas and the jackals or the lions, all of the carrion-eating animals have had their way, and these are dry bones. This is not someone who's just a, a, a CPR away from reliving. This is not someone who's ready for the clear machine and the paddles to get back to life. These people are long dead. Very many, very dry. And he said, Son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, uh, Lord God, <laughs> you know. We don't know is he saying that in the sense of, you know, what you, you know. You know you can do this. Or, oh, you know, not I. Or, you know, take the hand of God because no. You know, we, we don't know for sure. But God said to him, prophesy over these bones and you say to him, oh, dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. And we talked last week about the contrast between earlier in Ezekiel when the judgment is being issued upon Judah. And he says, you've got ears to hear, but you're not listening. And so judgment's coming. Here, the judgment's been there. But now that the judgment's there and their ears are gone, they've been devoured by the vultures. He's telling a bunch of bones to hear. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I'm going to cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And then I'm going to lay sinews upon you and flesh upon you and then cover you with skin and put breath in you and you'll live and then you'll know I am the Lord. And that's the start of the story. Now with that as the narrative, then we see, or the instructions, we see what actions Ezekiel took. Ezekiel did as he was told. 
I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound and a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to bone. That's the dim bone song. Toe, toe bones connected to the foot bone, foot bone connected to the ankle bone. Hear the word of the Lord. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh came upon them, and skin covered them, but still no breath. Let's pay attention to that and hold that in reserve in them. So then God said, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. The breath came into them, and they lived. They stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Now that tells you also they were an exceedingly great army before they became dim bones. And yet they were a devastated army who'd been judged by God. This time, they're a resurrected army. And the story finishes with verse 11 through 14. Then God said to Ezekiel, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, Hine, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost. We are cut off. That's the nifal of Gezer. It means we're dead. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm going to open your graves, and I'm going to raise you from your graves. O oh, my people, I'll bring you into the land of Israel. And you'll know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and I raise you from your graves, O oh, my people, and then I'm going to put my spirit within you and you shall live and I'll place you in your own land and you'll know I am the Lord. I've spoken. I will do it, declares the Lord. Case closed. Now that's the prophecy and that's what God had to say. So within the framework of this being in context and us examining this, what I'd like to do in the time we've got left is try to find the New Testament color that's in these passages. And the New Testament color, I've, got them, I've pulled out five. There are more, but these are the five that appealed to me to teach on today. First, I want you to see an interplay here between Spirit, with a capital S, as in the Spirit of God, Spirit as in the spirit or breath of a human, and wind, which is wind, <sighs> blows through. See, in the Hebrew and in the Greek, those are all the same word. So in the Hebrew, you've got this word ruach, and ruach, by the way, I challenged last week everybody to say hine if they were by themselves and it wouldn't bother them so they could say the, Greek, the Hebrew word behold. Hine, hine. I got a delightful video from the Wilson clan with all of the kids jumping out one behind the other. It looked like the sound of music and saying hine, hine, hine as they jumped down the stairs. So this week I challenge you if you're in a place where it will not embarrass you to go ahead and say ruach. Think of it as R-U-A-C-H with phlegm in your throat. Ruach. That is the Hebrew word for spirit. But it's also the Hebrew word for breath. And it's also the Hebrew word for wind. And so as we look at the story from the Ezekiel passage, you can see Ezekiel using that word in a pun manner. And so he brought me out in the Ruach of the Lord. So here's the Ruach, the Spirit of God. He sets me down in the valley. He says, can these bones live? And the Lord says, behold, I'll cause Ruach, again, to enter you. But now it's breath or a human spirit. It's like Genesis 2, 7, where God breathes His Spirit into humanity and humanity becomes, you know, I will cause you to have a human ruach 
enter you. And this is what's happened in the Spirit of God. I'm going to come upon you and I'm going to put ruach, again translated their breath, but the same Hebrew word, in you. And so he prophesies, as he, Ezekiel prophesies, as commanded, and all of this stuff happens, but there was no ruach, no spirit, no breath in them yet. All the same word. So God says, well, prophesy to the spirit, to the wind, to the breath. Prophesy and say to the ruach, the breath. Thus says the Lord, come from the four ruachs. And it's translated wind there. Same word. Spirit, breath, wind. Same word. It's just a play on this word. And, and they translate it winds there because the four winds makes you think it's not from four spirits, but he's referencing the winds, the four corners of the earth idea. So prophesy come from the four ruach, the four breaths, four winds, O wind or breath or spirit, and breathalize or breathe or windize or spiritize these slain so that they may live. So I did it, and the wind, the breath, the spirit came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet. And then it ends with this. So behold, all of this is going to happen, and I'm going to open your graves and raise you from the graves, and I'm going to put my ruach, same word, my spirit, my wind, my breath within you. And you'll live. You'll know I'm the Lord, that I've spoken and I do it. So that interplay is really interesting. And the interplay on spirit, spirit, and wind, Jesus does the same thing in John chapter 3. So in John chapter 3, we see Jesus making the same play on the same words. I've put John in, in uh, green. It's kind of hard to see on the computer terminal, but uh, blue and green. So in Ezekiel, this is Ezekiel. Uh, I'll keep Ezekiel blue. Let me be more consistent. There was no breath in them. So he said, prophesy to the breath. Say to the breath. Come from the four breaths, O breath. And I comm he commanded and the breath came. But you see, it's wind, it's breath, and then ultimately the Spirit of God. And then Jesus says it in like manner in John 3. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now somebody's watching this and they're saying, wait a minute. Jesus may have been speaking Hebrew or Aramaic, but the New Testament was written in Greek. So it can't be ruach. Ruach is a Hebrew word. You are correct. The Greek word is pneuma. And pneuma also means wind, spirit, breath. That which is born of the spirit, and the translators capitalize it there, but the New Testament Greek, it doesn't capitalize words to let you know when it's the Holy Spirit. That's the translator's job. But it seems that they've got it right, at least to me, is spirit, the concept, lowercase s. Jesus is making, you could translate that, that which is born of the wind is wind. But there, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit there. And he says, don't marvel that I said you must be born again. The wind, spirit, same word, ruach in Hebrew, pneuma in the Greek, blows where it wishes. You hear its sound. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it goes. That's the way it is with everybody who's born of the ruach who's born of Pneuma, who's born of the Spirit. Jesus makes that same play. Because Jesus wants us to understand that what God prophesied as redemption following judgment was finding its fruit and its color in the ministry of Jesus. This is the story where Jesus, Jesus has encountered Nicodemus and he's trying to explain to Nicodemus, do you get the story of the Valley of Dry Bones? Because I'm telling you, you've got to be born again. And Nicodemus, the teacher, well, I don't see how anybody can be born again. I mean, when you're dead, you're dead. Am I supposed to crawl back in my mother's womb? Jesus says, no, 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 no. 
Go back and read Ezekiel 37. This is the wind. This is the spirit. This is the breath. This is a born again from dead. You're dead in your trespasses, Paul says to the Ephesians. This is born again. Born anew. Born from above. Other ways to translate John's purposeful ambiguity in John 3. Because this is the work of God. Let me give you some more New Testament color. Let's look at the role of the Father and the Son in the New Testament. And we'll do this out of John chapter 5, but we'll also compare it out of Ezekiel. So compare Ezekiel 37, 8, and 10 with John chapter 5, 18 through 21. Here's Ezekiel. Say, God said to Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel says, Lord God, you know. This is, this is your domain, not mine. And thus says the Lord God to the bones, Behold, I'm going to cause ruach, spirit, breath, to enter you, and you will live. And I'll put spirit, breath in you, and you will live. And you will know I am the Lord. So in John chapter 5, it's a story of Jesus. And the, the, the Pharisees and others want to stone Jesus because Jesus is claiming to be equivalent to God the Father. Jesus is claiming to be the Lord God, Jehovah. And so we read the story. The Jews are seeking all the more to kill Jesus because he was making himself equal with God. And then Jesus says this. He says, and I don't have the start of the quote for Jesus, but Jesus says, As the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom He will. Now the Father raising the dead is Ezekiel 37. That was the real turning point in Jewish theology to understand, at least among a number of Jewish theologians, Sadducees never got there, but a number of Jewish theologians, that there is a life after dead beyond the shadows of Sheol. That there is a true resurrection life. A physical resurrection life from the dead. And Ezekiel 37 is the first real teaching on that in the Old Testament. Beyond the shadows of Sheol, the underworld, if you will. That's the seminal passage that teaches that God can bring life to bones that have decayed beyond recognition. And Jesus says that just as the Father can raise those dead people and give them life, so also the Son gives life to whom He will. Jesus is in that, O oh Lord, You know who can do it? Yeah, Jesus. God the Father, Jesus. One and the same. And yet, distinct. That's the beauty of the Trinity. That's another lesson. Next thing I want to look at. The hope of resurrected life. This is one, look at uh, Hebrews 37, I mean Ezekiel 37, 11. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. This isn't just the army. This is the whole, this is the story. This is the cosmic reality. And he nay, they say, our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are cut off. We're dead. And that is the mentality. Look, you don't have a resurrecting God. When you die, you are dead. D-A-D-E. Dead. You are gone. You are snuffed out. It is over. If there's no resurrecting God, you have zero confidence of what lies after death, except not you. 
And that's the world as it was until the resurrecting Lord. Here's what it says. Hebrews 6.19, we have this hope. Remember, the hope's cut off. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Those people didn't have a hope. But we live post-Jesus, who is a resurrected Lord. And the whole point of that is, there's a resurrection, and, and we're not in the camp of those who have no hope. We're in the camp of those who confidently expect. That's the meaning of that Greek word, el peace, that's translated hope. It's not like, I'm going to buy a lottery ticket and hope I win a big jackpot. No, not at all. It's, I confidently expect this. If you have any question about that, go read in the book of Acts where these men are making money off a woman who can tell the future. And they've been, she's been the gravy train. They've been making money off her right and left all day long, all week long. It was their occupation. And Paul casts the spirit out of her where she can prophesy about what's going to happen and divine the future. And the guys are really ticked off. But the passage says, when they saw that their hope of gain was lost. Not hope in the sense of a lottery. I mean, they just expect it every day. That, that's how they make their money. See, that word hope in the Greek sense means confident expectation. So the writer of Hebrews says, our confidence is not lost. It's been found. And within Hebrews 6.19, it's talking about the fact that Jesus, a resurrected Lord, has gone into the presence of God. And He can take us with Him. So our life is one that's lived in hope. And it's not just there, it's in the whole New Testament. That's the whole point. Is that we've got life after this is over with. Let me give you one more passage. We've got time for one more. The indwelling spirit. The Ruach. Look again at Ezekiel 37, 14, and let's compare it to John 14. In Ezekiel it says, God says, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. I'll place you in your own land. You'll know I'm the Lord. I've spoken. I will do it, declares the Lord. I mean, Jesus is, I mean, Ezekiel is saying something specific. Not, I'll put the Spirit outside you or I'll put the Spirit working in others. He says, I'm going to put the Spirit inside you, within you. And that's echoed by Jesus in John 14, where Jesus says, I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Jesus says, you know Him because He dwells with you. Of course He did. Jesus was full of the Spirit. So Jesus dwelt with the apostles. That meant the Spirit dwelt with the apostles. Jesus is full of the Spirit. But Jesus says, when I do this, He's going to be in you. He's going to be within you, not simply with you. Now, this Ezekiel 37, 14 comes right on the heels of verses 12 and 13. Make sense? You have 12, 13, and then 14. And that, whoops, that makes a lot of sense because as we talked last week, Ezekiel 37, 12 and 13 are really important to understand something in the New Testament. Look at this. Ezekiel 37, 12 and 13 says the following. Prophesy and say, I'm going to open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and bring you into the land of Israel, and you'll know I'm the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. That happened. That prophecy was a historic fulfillment that Matthew wants us to understand in Matthew 27. When he says, as Christ died, behold, hine in the Hebrew, that repeated word of Ezekiel 37, 
Matthew uses it as he do, but it's the same thrust. Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That's a reference to Jesus fulfilling the, the role of the curtain. Jesus, uh, the separation between the holy of holies and God and humanity, even the best of priests. Jesus' body was ripped by God from top to bottom. That curtain was ripped so that humanity can enter into the holy of holies. We don't enter in because we got good enough. We enter in because God destroyed the barrier between us and Him. It was torn, and look what happened. The earth shook. The rocks were split, the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the chosen ones, the saints, the Israelites, who'd fallen asleep, were raised and coming out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection, and they went into the holy city and appeared to many. What Ezekiel prophesied is fulfilled historically. I mean, you, when I was a kid and I read this passage in Matthew, I thought, well, that's kind of wackadoodle. Why is, why, why, what's this? I don't see dead people coming out of tombs and walking around. No, that was a fulfillment of the Ezekiel prophecy so that people would know that God is the Lord. Because he opened the graves and raised them from the graves. Oh, my people, saints, chosen ones. And it happened historically. And then the very next verse says, And I will put my spirit within you, and you'll live. And that's what happened next on Pentecost, just a few weeks later. When Peter is preaching and the Holy Spirit comes and it descends and, and, it, and, and it's no longer a selective Holy Spirit on the select few. It is a Holy Spirit that's coming upon everyone, your sons and your daughters, your old men, everybody. When you give your life to God, the Holy Spirit comes in. And this is the beauty of this. This is Jesus in John 14. These are just some of the New Testament color that we get as we examine this. But I'm out of time. And I don't want to conclude without drawing a bottom line picture for us all. I do hope we can understand that Scripture tells one massive cosmic story. There is a story arc that runs from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And within that one story arc, we understand that Jesus is the central figure who fulfills the true destiny of humanity. Our destiny is resurrected beings. Our destiny in the presence of God. Our destiny is something different than just humdrum existence of meaninglessness. We have in Jesus the true destiny of humanity because Jesus, a true human as well as God, brought humanity in to the throne of God. He did it through his suffering, his death, and conquering the final consequence of sin and giving life to the dead. Our hope. If we can bless you in any way, please email us. Want more at biblical-literacy.org. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to send you our daily videos. We'd love to send you announcements, anything like that. Meanwhile, let me bless you in the name of Jesus before we draw this to a close. Father, the resurrection and the life, the source of hope, the conquering God that you are, the God who's withstood thousands of years of history to still touch hearts today. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for the confident hope that we have of eternity in your care. Father, if we can trust you with eternity, certainly we should trust you with today. And so we give you today. In the name of Jesus, amen. <music>